Oi. So, uh, yeah, it's a bit strange talking about GDC, given that I've been on, on working on it for about two and a half years now, and I've never really spoken a, a should a word about it. So, uh, see, so yeah, interesting how this goes. Uh, so, I assume GDC knows, uh, needs no introduction. Um, it's a GNU decompiler, uh, which is one of the main porting efforts of uh, uh, D for the G uh, GNU backend. So, uh, brief outline of what I'm sort of going to go over. It's, uh, first off is the history of porting the D front end. Um, GDC isn't the first one to do so, and hope, well, kind of hoping that uh, it will, will be the last, but who knows. Um, and second point is going to be the current status of GDC, so where are we currently at with everything. Um, a little bit of a look into the anatomy of the GCC front end, um, whereas this talk's going to be mainly about you know, uh, GCC in general, I'm sort of hoping to sort of get on um, quite a few people into sort of testing and helping out with the development process. Um, I'm going to briefly go over a few uh, small extensions that GDC adds to the D language without adding a new syntax, so these cool little things that it's able to do, and also uh, future plans. But um, that's sort of in the pipeline and in the works. So, starting off, what is uh, GCC? Uh, GCC stands for the GNU Compiler Collection. It was uh, originally written for the GNU operating system, um, and it was developed to be 100% free software, as in terms of free as in um, the user's freedom, or Franklin Street free. Um, and roughly speaking, um, user, users both individually and collectively can contribute and improve upon the software. The uh, front end uh, has massive support for many uh, languages, including C, C++, Objective-C, Objective-C++, ADA, Fortran, Java, and Go. And so it's very well supported with a large uh, selection of C-like family. And uh, with varying degrees of support, it's uh, it can be able to target about 48 different architectures, um, as, um, as well as quite a few uh, platforms on that as well. And GCC for uh, homebrew architectures as well tends to be the go-to compiler. Uh, so it will be really, really cool if we ever sort of attract a crowd of homebrew CPU uh, people to actually get D onto their own architecture. And, but slightly for sort of these sort of reasons and possibly many, many more that uh, GCC became a natural uh, target for porting D within the open, and porting and supporting D within the open source. Uh, yeah, that's um, because at the time, Clang didn't yet exist. So, a uh, short history of porting the D front end. Well, I guess it sort of started around about 2002, um, where at the time, the well, D was very much in its infancy. Uh, uh, I think it's only really supported Windows 32 bit, and DMD was the only compiler out there. And a lot of people uh, sort of very uh, much voiced their opinions over, um, hey, you know, it'd be really cool if we sort of get this onto Linux. And, uh, you know, and sort of kind of holding them back in a, in a way. Um, but uh, thankfully enough, at around about April ish time, Walter actually released um, a portion of the front end as open source. Uh, this was in a, a dual GPL artistic license, and it sort of contained the necessary let's go analysis, uh, parser, and semantic analysis, which allowed people to sort of uh, take that and port it to their own backend. So hopefully, use it with the GNU sources. Um, uh, first use of um, this appearing uh, was about a month later in May. Uh, along with the birth of the D.GNU mailing list, uh, a couple of people got together and started a project, uh, one that was might like, called Bright D. Um, and the idea of this was to take the D front end and convert it to C, which was compatible with what GCC uh, 2.95 was written in at the time. Uh, however, this idea was very much um, pushed against because nobody actually wanted two separate uh, 
versions of the day front end 1 and C, 1 and C++. And bear in mind, this was also at a time where there had been no C++ front end written for GCC. Um, and convert and changing the GCC sources to actually be uh, compatible with C++ was completely out of the question as well. So what was instead done was kind of a marriage of the two, where we have the D front end sources, which in C++, in isolation, and then a glue layer, which would uh, be a mixture of C, C++, but be more like C enough to be happy with interacting with the GCC backend. And so Bright D became Open D. Uh, August, the race to port D to Linux was practically, well, DLI was more or less of a stopgap. Uh, rather than using any existing uh, backend, what he did, he uh, wrote his own custom backend within a mixture of C, and Python um, using the D front end sources. And this sort of enabled people to initially get porting over to Linux and do, do a few things. Um, whilst uh, sort of during this time, uh, the OpenD compiler uh, had successfully managed to port one of the uh, toy languages of GCC to C++ as a sort of proof of concept that this can be possible. Um, however, you know, it's, it was still very much in the works. After that, nothing really much came until about May 2003 when Walter actually uh, finished the race and actually ported DMD to Linux. Um, let's move that out of the way. And yeah, this pretty much killed off DLI given the fact that it's, people started moving away from it and uh, the original maintainer of it uh, had less and less time to devote to it. Um, also at this point in time as well, um, the OpenD compiler projects, they had got so far as um, setting up the front end with the compiler, so they sort of um, set up the sources, pass it to the front end, it returns a representation, but nothing had been done to actually generate GCC cogen at this stage. And, and in fact, that wasn't even anywhere near complete until February 2004, um, where the GDMD compiler was released. Uh, this uh, used the GCC 3.3 uh, sources, uh, which was really nicer to use than uh, the 2.95. And But one thing to note about GDMD is that it was still very much feature incomplete. So for example, uh, there was no such thing as DRAs, um, classes were unimplemented, and it lacks a garbage collector in the runtime. So still, you, you wouldn't really use it for any sort of production. But the uh, wait for a near enough production ready compiler was um, actually a lot sooner than what people expected. Uh, I suppose you saw, hopefully you'll be aware of him. He's called uh, uh, David Friedman. He uh, released DGCC. Uh, th this actually, the uh, uh, compiler sources that GDC is actually based off today. Uh, but he uh, sort of had his own sort of little brew in the background and was sort of waiting until it came sufficiently stable enough to actually announce it. Um, that was done in March 2004. It was pretty much near uh, feature complete and was already supporting Linux and OS X. And uh, by 2008, uh, DGCC had already been ported to um, at least 16 different architectures uh, across Linux, FreeBSD, Sigwin, MinGW, and AIX. Uh, th this is for D1. D2 is a different story that I should probably get to in a moment. <laughs> um, so, that was all going along swimmingly. Uh, so we've got DMD and GCC, and Clang started to emerge around about 2005, I believe it was, or 2006, and this all sparked a lot of interest in saying, hey, you know, we want this, you know, here we're about NLVM. It'd be really cool if we sort of you know, port D to it, given it that it's uh, written in um, a rather tasty subset of C++, and it's sufficiently easier to you know, sort of compile and use yourself. And there's sort of all these really nice technologies that we'd probably put into it. And so, yeah, that, that was, effort was started around about September 2007, and yeah, it's been growing ever since. I perhaps used the word abandoned a little bit hastily here, but uh, essentially around about 2008 time, uh, David Freeman 
Um, sadly, he sort of left the D scene um, due, due to reasons that I'm not really sure of. And nobody uh, really wanted to pick up the development of DG GDC. And uh, anyway, this sort of, when I first came onto the scene uh, in D, um, there was this huge rift between DMD being updated and Audi C and GDC falling massively behind and being completely irrelevant. And this is possibly the main thing that hurt the most when I sort of came through. Um, yeah, in fact, it was over a year it actually went stale. Um, the, the, the GDC revival project was started by uh, two people, one called Michael, the other Vincenzo, um, aka Goshawk, if you're aware of him. And yeah, they kicked this off for, by starting the, the D2 uh, port, uh, implementing D2, uh, starting practically at the start and then just merging. Um, up one level each time and sort of fixing bugs as they come along. And um, yeah, and around about the end of the year is where I sort of came along. I suppose this uh, kind of wants a little bit of an explanation. Uh, I sort of discovered um, D around about the beginning of 2009, um, having sort of used C and C++ to write various toy languages. And all sorts of really, really cool compiler, but I was rather unhappy at the fact that there didn't really seem to be a compiler available for a GCC, which is what I used um, all the time at home. Uh, but this sort of like turned around when someone actually mentioned on IRC, I do believe it was FEEP you'll have to blame for this, uh, by sort of posting me a link to the uh, new GDC page on Bitbucket, to which I sort of went, hi, you know, how are you doing? And sort of looked at all the documentation, and just started contributing. You know, after a few uh, front-end merges, they gave me the keys to it. And uh, whether or not that's a good idea, I'm yet to discover. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I've really just been taking the helm ever since uh, that happened. And um, yeah, uh, as far as D1's concerned, I think the last front-end merge was 1.56. Seven, I can't remember now, but uh, uh, D1 was last updated uh, just before t 2013, um, and D2 is currently on the current head, uh, which is 2.62. So, so far, most of what I've really been discussing about is about D1. Um, and there is, is this little bit of a question on where we're, whether or not we're actually going to see an end of life for D1 as we sort of move into uh, D2. I mean, part of this was LDC switching to D2, being the default compiler. Um, then Andre announced of the discontinued support uh, starting from 2013. However, so far as I've seen, this has not really taken effect. And in at sort of the beginning of 2012, I actually dropped D1 development completely. Um, this was also part of a, a small cleanup project as well because I wanted to separate D1 and D2 compiler rather than have them both merged into the same uh, sources. And um, as for D2, the current state that we see today, um, well, we've got three main compilers based off the D2 front end. Uh, across them, we've got pretty much solid platform support for Linux, FreeBSD, uh, OS X, Solaris, and Windows. And target support, um, ARM and PowerPC is pretty much covered between G, uh, GDC and LDC, and all three of them do have uh, x86 and 64-bit. And we also see that the um, D-run time is gaining more support for more targets as we get people you know, adding in more porting patches, and Phobos is becoming uh, more platform agnostic. However, that might just be a future truth I'd throw in there. Hopefully it would be. <laughs> so the uh, current status of GDC. So, as I said, we support the current release, which is the 2.062. Um, test suite, 95% um, of uh, tests, uh, well, bear in mind that in this, we actually removed quite a few uh, tests that aren't relevant. Um, we'll mention them in a moment but uh, we are passing about 95% of them, and 
although that says work being done on passing D runtime Phobos unit tests, I have weeded out the most difficult ones that caused the compiler to crash. So hopefully that would be no problem. And anybody wanting to test the um, Phobos unit tests should be able to. So target support, um, yeah, x86, 64 bits, you know, absolute solid support. Uh, there has been some work done on ARM. It's, um, we can do Hello World, I can say that much. Uh, ditto with MIPS. However, uh, there are some uh, corner cases as soon as you start making large applications, uh, things might go a little bit funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's all I'm gonna say on that matter. <laughs> so, and for anything else, there should be no reason whatsoever why the compiler shouldn't work for it. However, what is missing, and very, very crucially, is that we don't have any library support for these platforms. And so it's sort of kind of calling out, you know, need people who have hardware or emulators to, you know, get GDC and get testing on it and send patches to us. Because at the end of the day, we want to improve it and get more uh, of a larger audience. Um, platform support. Quite the same, really. Uh, Linux, I use Linux day in, day out um, on all, practically all my machines, so it's thoroughly tested on that. Uh, BSD support should be there because it's because of the similarities between the two, and I know that uh, FreeBSD is supported very well within DMD. Uh, OSX does lack t uh, t thread local storage support, um, and I think me and Brad were actually looking through OSX the other day, um, and I can also there's also fiber support missing for this as well, because we don't uh, do inline ASM. And uh, Windows-wise, I would honestly say that it's still an alpha quality. Um, although there are MinGW releases done by uh, a really lovely contributor called Daniel Green. Um, what he does, he changes quite a lot of GCC proper to actually get TLS working and also changes quite a bit in the linker and none of what he's done will ever be folded in so far as I can see, at least not in the near future. But you are free to actually try out these binaries. I did actually change this title to be a little bit more subtle. But what the heck? <laughs> To hell with DMD compatibility. Um, so, starting off, GDC follows the quorum uh, convention as per the, the spec. If you look on the website, it says that the, uh, uh, well, the D calling convention is actually defined for Windows 32 bits. For e every other platform, it's as the target is specified. So, we do this. Um, so, we follow the whatever the target supports, which may just happen to be CDECL. As I said, except for Windows 32 bits, which actually defines the calling convention. Um, also for Windows, uh, this is actually a recent change with how GDC, uh, GCC back in works for x86. Um, methods and delegates will actually use this called calling convention. Um, it's there just so it just works. That's all I'm going to say on that matter. There's no D in iron assembly uh, implemented. This, well, there was at a time, but this uh, was quite a problematic uh, implementation. And rather than trying to fix it, uh, it was easier just to remove it completely, just to make people happy. And also, we don't really have naked function support. Uh, although there are some targets which do define a naked attribute, uh, we don't really take advantage of this. And unlike DMD, uh, the VA list actually matches the C ABI rather than being a void pointer. SIMD, um, we, although we support vectors, we don't actually do this uh, SIMD function call, which I sort of thought was a little bit of a, a hack. And I could see no easy way to actually do it within uh, GDC. Um, vector sizes, uh, unlike DMD, we also allow eight byte vectors. Um, that kind of got in there by accident. I was just sort of testing things out, and it just sort of snuck into one of the commits. Uh, somebody noticed this and uh, forwarded a patch to uh, caught up SIMD. It said, hey, why don't we throw in these aliases, to which I sort of looked at the code and said, oh, man. Um, 
But as it's there, I thought, I'm, no point removing it, just keep it in. Um, and besides, I'm sure m m some people would actually find that really, really useful. And uh, unlike DMD as well, there's actually no current restrictions on what targets can actually support vectors. Uh, so if there's, uh, if, you, if you use vector on a target that doesn't support it, then, uh, well, it would just emulate vectors which would cause unwanted slowness. Um, so there, I have got an idea in the works, however, it's not been really there in GCC proper, but it, it should be possible via some sort of hook. Um, rather than using DMD coverage or profiling, um, I just say that you know, you, we use GCOV and GPROV uh, in replace of that. And similarly, um, we do have a wrapper script, which sort of serves as a sort of replacement for DMD. Uh, however, this is now maintained separately rather than being part of the GDC compiler. And no support for the uh, ddwarf exceptions that are defined in the spec. Uh, what we instead do is just um, generate C-like uh, debugging. So, the anatomy of a deep front end. What? Okay, so starting off, the entry barrier for GCC has um, got considerably lower during the last couple of years. I should know because it was really difficult two years ago. <laughs> and yeah, it's getting a lot easier. I mean, part of what's actually made it a lot easier is uh, sort of, uh, I think last year they sort of uh, made the entire code base uh, compatible with C++. So you could use a C or C++ compiler to build GCC. Um, transparently. They've since switched the default compiler to C++ and actually started introducing uh, a via the sort of tasty uh, subset uh, of features such as uh, templates to uh, replace the ugly macros and um, with, with some internal types they've also got operator overloading. So uh, if you're a C++ developer it's certainly um, a lot easier to get started in GCC. Um, well, uh, GCC is able to uh, translate from a variety of source languages into assembly. And uh, with one command, um, sprinkled with uh, a lot of declarations, uh, it's able to go through this entire process. Um, so how does it do this? Uh, the front end is made up of two components. There's a compiler driver and a compiler proper. The uh, compilation driver is the user interfacing application. Uh, it knows all about the languages that GCC supports or was built for, and given a source file, it can determine what to, uh, which compiler proper, uh, proper it's actually for. So if I say pass a, uh, a D -suffix, uh, suffix file to GCC, it'll say, hmm, this is a D source file. I'm going to pass it to the CC1D compiler. And it then launches the compiler proper and passes its outputs to the assembler and eventually the linker. Uh, also, depending on the command line switches, uh, the entire process uh, can be stopped at any point in time. So the uh, compiler proper. For each language supported by GCC, there's one compiler proper. Um, each is in its own executable, and the job of it is to turn source file into assembly. Um, the compiler proper itself is composed from three components, a front end, a back end, and a middle end. Uh, just like the compilation process done by the driver, um, you could probably see this as, as sort of like a, a pipeline or, or a stream. So you sort of start from the top and each part uh, converts the um, representation into a, a yet lower level one. Um, there are two intermediate languages between the three front ends. Um, between the front end and middle end, there's generic, and between the middle end and back end, there's RTL, or register transfer language. Uh, so the front end itself it contains all the language processing logic. Uh, the goal of the front end is to analyze the source program and ensure that all types and are correct and all constraints uh, required by the language definition hold. Uh, if everything is sound, then it generates uh, a generic representation of the program. Uh, the low level inter intermediate language uh, used between middle and back end, as I've mentioned, is RTL. Um, both middle end and back end do various optimizations on their intermediate representation before they turn into a yet a low level one. Um, uh, both interfaces that I've mentioned, generic and RTL, are unidirectional. Uh, so 
although the front end may feed generic to the middle end and middle end feeds RTL to the back end, sometimes the other direction is required. So, uh, for instance, uh, if the middle end has to obtain information uh, about the language, um, any, anything about the language is not held anywhere else but the front end. So there are particular language hooks to actually retrieve this information uh, so it knows what to do when it comes to the compilation process. And lastly, the back end is the, um, well, actually, it's probably worth noting that the middle end and front end are the independent part. The back end is then the, the uh, dependent part, uh, and that emits uh, target assembly code. You don't really need to know anything about um, the back end in order to be a front end maintainer, but you will need to know how generic works. So um, generic is a uh, tree language. Um, and being a tree language, it's uh, got very Lisp-like qualities. Um, as well as any behaving, well-behaving tree, it's recursive in nature, having both internal and leaf nodes. Uh, internal nodes are capable of holding other internal nodes. Uh, typically, leaves are, say, identifiers, uh, integer constants, and internal nodes are then unaries and uh, binary operations, uh, blocks, containers, and so forth. Um, there, apart from predefined generic nodes, uh, you are able to define your own nodes, um, which uh, don't, which have a different meaning to uh, what generic is, is capable of holding. Uh, however, if you do define them, you must uh, then uh, convert it yourself to to the lower level rather than the back end taking care of it. Uh, from an expressive point of view, uh, you can sort of think of generic uh, as similar to C. It's, um, and from a notational point of view, it's very similar to Lisp. Uh, generic is capable of uh, representing whole functions, um, as in it supports everything that is to represent in a typical C function, so loops, conditionals, function calls, etc. And uh, for optimization purposes, however, generic is still too high level a representation. And during the compilation process, it's lowered to um, a yet lower level. And this one is called Gimple. Uh, so um, Gimple is a subset of generic. And the so best way to sort of describe this is that um, the process of turning generic to Gimple is called uh, gimp Gimplification. And uh, Gimple works kind of recursively, um, turning all the original GIMP, uh, generic expressions into um, three address tuples. Um, although there are some exceptions to this, such as function calls holding more than three addresses. Um, in a high gimple, actually there's probably some, there's high gimple and low gimple as well. Uh, in high gimple, nesting structures uh, still represent blocks in gimple, uh, but all expressions are broken down. Uh, with, uh, and temporaries are introduced within gimple, uh, which hold intermediate values when passing things around. In uh, low level gimple, or uh, there's further transformations with all blocks uh, turning into go-tos and labels. So it's, very, it's pretty much sort of flattening and removing all lexical scopes and then doing the optimizations from there. So just to sort of wrap this up, how the deep fronting comes into the works. So GDC itself sets up the um, uh, back end and front end. Uh, so all global parameters and where the source files are located and it then sends all this data to the front end to process. Uh, the front end then takes care of any uh, language dependent things and returns a representation to GDC glue layer. Uh, this glue layer then takes the defrontend representation and generates generic, which is to be sent to the back end. And the compilation process down there is just as I've explained. So, simple D program. You'll probably see this again when uh, David does his talk. But uh, this is really just sort of show you uh, what the representation kind of looks like. So pretty much identical. As I said, it is representing a C-like function from a point of view. Um, rep value is just uh, an internal uh, leaf node within a function that uh, holds the decal result. And again, from a list point of view, you can just see we've got a binary expression which holds the entire function body, and we're sort of returning, initializing the value with a plus expression AB. 
The GIMP application of this, again, it flattens all this and creates temporaries where required. Let's have a look at a more interesting program. So, no need to describe, tell you what this is. This is uh, Fibonacci, does it recursively to find the answer. And um, again, what you can see from a, a C-like perspective, it's pretty much identical. And the gimplification process, again, flattens everything down. So we're creating five new temporaries and a temporary for the if statement and removing all blocks and having labels and go-tos. Yes? You want to go back and look at that? Those longs are going to be initialized. Sorry? Those longs are going to be initialized or sort of implicitly void? Um, because they're, well, they will be initialized down here. Yeah, so the, the, the question was whether they're in unnecessarily initialized when no. they're... No. Okay. There's no unnecessary initialization. Are they just negative one and negative two? Sorry? Yeah. Yes. It's, uh, Gimple doesn't do minus. It only has plus expressions, strangely enough. So that's why you've got <laughs> those two ridiculously high numbers there. That's just for negative one, negative two. <laughs> And uh, it's probably also worth noting that when it comes down to the, the, the Gimple uh, representation, uh, both are pretty much identical to each other. So GDC extensions. Let's start off with, yeah, custom static chains. Um, so for all um, nested functions within uh, GDC, uh, a custom static chain is created for it. And this is to hold any, um, sort of, any nested variables that are accessed from lower down are thrown into this. Um, this is a, a typical closure. This is nothing new for, for DMD. Closures are created within the front end. And so what we've got here, a closure will be created at this point in time. Um, our nested fu function uh, won't create uh, static chain, what I'm going to said do is use the closure from above, pass it straight down to Baz, and then X is then dereferenced from the closure from above. And this is kind of what it looks like in the gen uh, generated code. And uh, yeah, I said, is the um, top level function foo defining the closure pointer? Uh, this value expression is for uh, debug purposes. Uh, so when you say print x, it will actually print this value here, rather than having two separate variables in place. Uh, closure pointers initialized uh, on the heap, and then we set all the values. So chain is null, x is 7, and return the delegates. And as I mentioned, because uh, there's no nested variables within this function, it just passes the this straight down below. Um, where a closure is not required, however, as I said, uh, a static chain is created on the stack. Um, this is required mostly for delegates because um, although the, the GCC backend really has no knowledge of how delegates work, um, in the fact that although it can create a, 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 a frame for the function, um, you, you can't really do anything with it. And with scope delegates especially, we're required to actually uh, put that frame as an object, so that it's able to use that object when you call it. And again, very similar to before, only we sort of give it a new name frame. Um, it's not, it's on the stack, so it's not a pointer. And again, initialize the values, set the object to the frame, and then call the delegate. So any questions over how this works or it's all pretty much straightforward. Yes? Yeah, um, you have a chain, um, a chain member of the frame pointer. Yeah. Each time in your example, you initialize it to new. Yeah, so the idea is if you've got, um, oh. okay, you go ahead. Okay, so you have a chain member in your frame structure, 
And in all of your example, you initialize it to nil. So I wanted to know what usage it has. Um, say you've got, um, no, we sort of go back to here. Say if we've got a variable here that's also accessed from below, this would also create a closure to which its chain would be the closure above. So to access x, you go up the chain twice. Uh, but to access, let's say, um, int y, you just go up the chain once. Yep. Uh, we also have a module called gcc.builtins. Um, this gives access to built-ins provided by the GCC backend. Uh, roughly speaking, how it works is uh, that there's about 800 functions uh, defined within GCC, and we try to convert it to um, a representation that the defronting can handle. If we're able to do this, we then squirt it out into the module. Um, the benefit of things like this is the fact that GCC knows what these functions are and so can optimize it in particular ways. And as you can see here, is sort of the representation when it's turned into uh, Gimple. Uh, the square root is actually expanded completely and you've got this ridiculously large number. Oh, well. I can't do that <laughs> when I say large number. It's larger than my arm width. <laughs> you know, uh, as well as functions, we also define aliases to internal types. Um, this is really just for uh, convenience. Uh, so rather than uh, having version identifiers to say what the target C uh, long int type is, we just, you know, yes. Um, that that floating point constant looks larger than 80 bits. So is GCC internally doing constant folding at a higher precision than uh, 80 bits? Yeah, um, we don't actually use uh, any sort of floating uh, point uh, arithmetic within GCC. Uh, the, the realty type is actually um, emulates um, floating point operations. It's just, just a structure with. Um, encoded data inside it. I think it's capable of whole in doing 192 bits. Okay, so it's... So it, it's very similar to IEEE. Nine, is it 9754 so even? So is it, it actually does constant folding at a higher precision? Yes. The, the idea being uh, for, for cross-compilation, uh, you're able to, to do uh, operations at a much higher precision than what the host is capable of doing if the target is capable of, of holding that. Okay, does it do a higher precision than the target is capable of if that precision... Um, does, does it always yes. do the 190-bit constant folding? Yes. Regardless of the precision of the target? Yes. Is this okay. aimed at Don by any chance? Well, it's, it's fuel, <laughs> fuel for the fire. <laughs> <laughs> Well, might it speed up compilation to uh, only use the size that, um, of whatever target is being compiled to? Might well, slow down compilation a little to use that large. Uh... Oh, well, that's. Was there a question in there? Um, actually, um, <laughs> well, my Vladimir just said that um, doing that would reduce compounding of errors, so that is a point to make. Of, um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. As I was saying, yeah, we define um, aliases to internal types, uh, really just for convenience. Um, so rather than having a load of uh, version identifiers, so if for this target do this, 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 um, you can just import GC built-ins, and they're already there. Um, implementing intrinsics into D. Uh, D already has quite a few intrinsics. These are located within core.bit and core.math. Uh, the way that uh, GDC implements this, uh, for core.math in particular, they are all mapped to uh, GCC built-ins, uh, whereas anything in core.bit op, with the exception to the uh, in-p, out-p related functions, they're actually uh, co-generated on the fly. As you can see here, so, R&D toll, 
converted to built in LL round L. And the bit C is again sort of checks that and sets. Um, as well as that, uh, one cool thing, cool thing that we do is sort of extend upon this and actually map uh, any um, externality function that doesn't have a body that's located in core.sdc uh, to GCC built ins. Um, this has the advantage of the fact that anything within this module uh, is actually recognized as a built in. Uh, of course, it can be turned off using ethno built in switch. So, again, another example <coughs> using pal l, and it comes down to here where it folds it rather than just doing an external C call. Uh, it's probably also worth noting that if it's not able to uh, fold it, then it will just call a library call. Uh, as I've said, the, the VAS type um, matches the C ABI and is not a void. Uh, it's defined within GCC built-ins as an alias. And uh, it's within this module that we do some special processing. So, uh, for example, uh, I think the only function that's really uh, used is the um, uh, VA arg function that accepts the type info. That's actually done at runtime. Uh, everything else is just an empty bodied template that's recognized by the compiler and then expanded accordingly. So, simple example. And as we can see here, we've got built in VA start, which is uh, handled by the target. And VA arg is just an expression. Um, just the attributes. Uh, there used to be a pragma called uh, pragma attribute and pragma set attribute in the language. Um, this has since been removed uh, since the introduction of UDA syntax uh, because of some rather tasty um, ways of actually hashing out things in the language. Uh, we've defined uh, a, a structure, uh, a template structure within gc.attributes, and the idea being that using UDA syntax, we can sort of map this to GCC um, attributes. Uh, similarly, the same can be done for types. However, I've really seen um, no need for this because. Uh, for example, I've got here uh, attribute aligned. However, the same can also be carried out just by having the aligned keyword within D. Uh, and, and of course, as of writing, none of this has really been implemented, but the framework is in place. Uh, so if anybody's got any ideas for attributes they really want to see in GDC, um, just sort of give me a shout or bell or whistle. Uh, as I've already mentioned, um, GDC doesn't really do uh, D in line assembler. However, it can uh, handle, um, well, it implements a variant of that using uh, of the GCC extended assembly. Uh, extended assembly allows you to optionally uh, specify the operands. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more expressive than D in line assembler. And the benefits of it as well is the fact that uh, you can also um, optimize around it and inline it into other functions, um, as well as also being available for nearly all targets. Um, and given the fact that the um, actual assembly that you pa uh, pass to it is a, uh, a constant string, you could do some fancy little uh, compile time work around it to actually generate assembly code. As I mentioned, it doesn't print it really inlined. And yeah, you can do common optimizations such as dead code removal. Future plans. So short term, this is currently almost finished. I've probably got about another day's work left to do on this. Uh, there are three particular files within the DMD front end that are facing the DMD back end. My intention is to actually sort of remove this uh, DMD back end facing code and just to um, emit uh, generic trees directly, uh, hopefully fixing quite a few bugs that it's caused in the process. Um, ARM being probably the main key one that I'm wanting to get working. Uh, TLS support, for the moment, um, as, as I've already mentioned, the GCC segregates between the front end and back end. And so target specific things generally aren't 
really uh, touched from the front end, and TLS is kind of one of those. Although we can mark uh, variables as TLS, um, we don't really know where it will land uh, within the file. So having a, a TLS start and TLS end, although we process TLS start initially and delay TLS send to the end, um, sometimes it doesn't quite work that way. Um, I mean, an, ide an ideal solution for TLS support would actually be have it in the linker because that way it's guaranteed to always be first and last symbol. Um, better support for LTO. I know we've had mixture support of this for quite some time, um, but I really haven't had a look at it, but it would be really, really cool if we'd um, uh, get better support for it because people had a lot of um, interest in it. Yes, link time optimization. Long term, yeah, we should really kickstart testing D2 on more targets. Um, again, as I said at the start, you know, if anybody's got any hardware or has got any boxes lying about, you know, uh, I'll be happy to sort of you know, jump on and you know, compile GDC and actually get things porting. Um, or if anybody wants to sort of take over uh, the role of porting for me on that box and send me patches, you're willing more, more than enough willing to, uh, free enough to do so. Um, yeah, there's not too much missing in terms of optimization um, that DMD actually takes advantage of that D, uh, GDC doesn't. Uh, first of those is uh, name return value optimization. Um, this is really, really simple. Um, you're basically just binding uh, the value that you want to return to the decal result. And POD uh, structures, um, they're not implemented either, um, mostly because when you turn it on, it causes a lot of difficulty. Um, and it, there's some conflicts in uh, the implementation, in the fact that because we try to uh, emulate left to right um, evaluation, uh, that sometimes creates a lot of temporaries that violates this type. <laughs> and um, this would probably never happen, but one can always wish. Uh, the, currently, the, the D front end is uh, separated from the GCC garbage collector. And in fact, we, we also um, have a, a, sort of, sort of a D list. Uh, which holds all uh, allocated memory inside this list, so there's always a reference to it, so that the GCC garbage collection doesn't collect it um, unexpectedly, causing some rather strange memory bugs. And last thing on the list, really, is um, label off runs in an assembler, uh, which I thought would just be rather cool. Um, Library support-wise, um, we still don't do exception chaining. I know David's had a brief look into it from the RDC side, but um, yeah, we should really sort of get down and uh, get that resolved. Um, well, I'm not sure if you're aware too much, but uh, LDC and GDC uh, uses lib unwind rather than the uh, DMD, which has its own bespoke exception table. Um, one thing that's possibly on the table is to uh, convert all the uh, inline assembler into extended assembly. Um, it's not really a big deal. Uh, things tend to work just fine as is, um, although probably one argument for that would be OSX and fiber support. Um, again, finish off the port of ARM, although I'm pretty certain most is already there, and it's just one or two compiler tweaks that need to be done. And again, fix the GCC runtime for TLS support for reasons that I've already mentioned. Um, other than that, yeah, it's pretty much vital that we begin testing on and gain more support for uh, target architectures and platforms. Uh, I do believe that this is a rather crucial thing in uh, actually getting across to, to a wider audience of people. Um, I mean, unlocking the mobile market is quite a big thing to me, and um, it'd be really cool if we'd uh, get a little bit a start of de-development on mobile phones, uh, as well as gaming platforms such as PowerPC. Um, you know, that's really all I have to say, really. So uh, there's sort of the website and wiki and the uh, Bugzilla page if you've got any bugs. 
Any questions? <laughs> yes. Where, where's the GitHub address? Um, you find it on the main page. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Um, so, which platforms is uh, TLS actually giving you trouble on? Uh, it's giving trouble on MinGW because. Um, I fixed that for LDC. Yes. So, yeah. It should you be have, possible without linking. You have patches. in the runtime. However, it's compiler support. It's still emulated, and it's probably going to stay that way for quite some time. Oh, and you can't switch it off on the GCC side. You can't switch the emulated TLS off from the front end. Uh. No. OK, that's, yeah. I can mark things as having thread local support for the target, but it will recognize this and switch it to the right one, unfortunately. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, is there any news about the merge to GCC? Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, merging wise, it's as soon as I finished off the um, removing of the DMD back and facing code. I mean, when I, I think I, it's been quite a long process. Um, not least because, uh, well, we're waiting for all copyrights to be assigned. Uh, I know it sort of started off with Walter, um, sort of sending me an email or, or a chat on Skype, saying that you know, he's assigned copyright of the D front end to the Free Software Foundation. Um, I've had to send along my papers. Uh, they got accepted quite fine. And the third part is for uh, David Freeman's uh, part of the final, because a lot of what he's done is still within GDC. And I'm yet to hear back to confirm, but it was currently in the process. It doesn't normally take too long, but I would have thought that that part of aspect would have been uh, completed by now. Um, and uh, I, I think we, I first submitted uh, GDC for merge uh, around about October last year. And there were quite a lot of good feedback um, in terms of improvements and things that they didn't quite like about how the implementation was done. Um, part of it was like, the fact that they didn't like the fact that I made quite a lot of changes to the D front end in order for it to get it to working with GDC. Um, that they really liked the idea of the front end being some agnostic to whatever back end it's targeting. Um, that we have sort of started work on that, uh, but it's not fully complete, but it's at a stage where I'm quite happy with it. As soon as I've removed the last of the back-end facing code, then it should be sort of all sailing. Um, the, the, there were some uh, other things, such as um, they, they didn't like the fact that uh, the current inline assembly, uh, GDC did support D inline assembly at one point, but they just saw it as one big x86 hack and it depended on uh, back-end headers that I wasn't aware at the time were poisoned from the front end to be used. Um, so rather than trying to fix the fact that we're using poisoned headers, um, I just found it a lot easier just to remove it completely, just taking the quick solution. Let's take everything else offline. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <you. laughs> All right, so um, let's take just two minutes, okay? Two minutes quick break, two minutes.